Hello guys, Winston here with a potential sinus infection, so please forgive me if I'm sounding a little congested today. Part of the reason I was so excited to move across the country was for a fresh start with regards to my shop. In the four years I spent living in that Tom's River townhouse I knew as the Machine Shop of Horrors 2.0, I'd built up a lot of infrastructure and habits I just wasn't proud of. For example, at one point I set up a folding plastic table as a drying station for batched projects, and that became a permanent fixture of the garage. It kept accumulating stuff faster than I could put things away. And then, my lack of garage tool organization, save for a single crappy tool chest that barely rolled, meant that I kept most of my tools indoors and would have to go inside to get whatever I needed, or they just permanently resided on my workbench. These caused tiny slowdowns every time I needed to get a tool or figure out where I'd put it down last. My Shapeoko 3 enclosure was my first real non-workbench 2x4 project, and there were little things about it that bugged me. The fact that it was just a tiny bit too low for me to lean into without smacking my head on that top crossbeam was a minor but recurring frustration. My USB cables were routed in a way that barely reached my laptop, I wanted brighter lights inside, there were just a ton of little things I would have changed about it in hindsight. And because I had no intention of staying in South Jersey, I put no effort into improving my situation. That's why it was essential that I got a fresh start. So as soon as I got to California, I started planning. My first order of business was establishing an organization system. I'm sharing this nominally two-car garage with my aunt for probably a good chunk of 2019, which means I'll have one less wall to work with than before, so putting things on wheels was super important to me. To address my tool storage issue, I decided to build myself a clamp and tool rack since it would make life a lot easier for subsequent projects. All of my tools, save for a few up to this point, were still in boxes, so giving them a home and making them accessible was a high priority. I did some window shopping on the internet to get some ideas and ended up going with wall control. This meant my cart needed to be 32 or 48 inches wide. 48 was a bit much, so I ended up at 32. This cart basically designed itself after I laid down some constraints. Now, 2x4 construction is something I really hate, because you can't trust any of the faces of your building materials to be square, so you basically can't make any assumptions about adjacent members. But even if I'd somehow come into a large sum of money, it would still be really idiotic to build a clamp rack out of 80-20, so 2x4s is the way to go. A CNC enclosure, on the other hand, that's a different matter, because there are elements of the structure that are functional. You can't mount a door to a parallelogram, for example, your frame has to be square. So building a 2x4 enclosure was a decision that really pained me. But at the end of the day, the cost per linear foot of 80-20 was just too much for me to swallow, and I really didn't want to buy some angle iron and borrow someone's welder. Plus, the density and thickness of wood means it'll do a better job of dampening sound than metal channels with thin wall panels. But the choices and constraints that I set for myself, though, may not be applicable to you. For example, I've heard of another guy who's making an enclosure that's short enough to be an outfeed table for his table saw. He can't afford the floor space to dedicate to a CNC shrine. Everyone's going to approach the enclosure problem from a slightly different angle. When I first started dimensioning out my enclosure, I wanted to maximize my use of off-the-shelf hardware and materials. So if I could avoid cutting polycarbonate for the windows, that would make me very happy. And if I could minimize the number of plywood cuts I needed to make, that would make me even happier. Even though the quality of the cuts off the Home Depot panel saw aren't that great, not having a track saw means that I agonize over trying to get my cuts straight. So that was one area I was happy to let someone else do the work for me. The way I intended to put my enclosure together meant that I could just take two sheets of plywood and ask the sales associate to make a bunch of 28 inch cuts. With a physical stop on the panel saw, which I had to suggest to the guy there, these cuts would be damn near foolproof and identical. Internally, I wanted more than 48 inches of width, since I'm going to want to run electrical, vacuum, and maybe air alongside my machine. I ended up deciding to just sister a couple 2x4s to make up the difference, but in hindsight I should have cut some smaller plywood panels to fill the gaps. That would have let me route power through the floor without drilling through a 2x4 in the worst way possible. The Shapeoko space also had to clear my head so I wouldn't keep smacking the back of my head into the frame. I whipped up a crude CAD model in Fusion 360 to help me figure out my cut list and made a lumber run. My order of operations for the construction revolved around building three sets of common frames that would form a storage shelf, the Shapeoko shelf, and the ceiling of my enclosure. These frames differed only in the number of cross braces which made the cut list really easy. I only needed to cut two different lengths. Precision doesn't matter too much here because even a slightly twisted or warped 2x4 will blow your tolerances out of the water far more than the effects of sloppy measuring on your part. And despite my best efforts picking through the lumber pile at Lowe's, my 2x4s were not perfect. Next I attached the legs. In case you're wondering, I am pre-drilling all my holes because my 12 volt impact driver doesn't have the oomph to sink a 2.5 inch screw in one go. 
And once I had the enclosure frame together, I put casters on it so I could maneuver the entire thing around my garage. I'm using these PowerTech casters for this enclosure. They're functionally identical to the Rockler casters, but they're provisions to use four mounting screws which I prefer, and they're a few dollars cheaper. After getting the frame rolling, I finally got to assess its usability. My constraint with the height of the Shapeoko shelf had been that it needed to be within two feet of the ceiling. My intent was to buy a pair of 2 by 2 foot polycarbonate panels from McMaster as the doors of the enclosure. That thought process resulted in an enclosure that might have looked okay in renderings, but in person, that shelf was just awkwardly high. The Shapeoko would end up sitting above my elbows. If I'd looked into plastic suppliers who could cut sheets to custom lengths, I might have opted to get Lexan panels that were maybe 24 by 30 inches tall. I decided to do the next best thing though and use a hinged 1x6 board at the top of the enclosure to preserve my head clearance and drop the Shapeoko shelf and doors by 5.5 inches. I was a lot happier with this new height and it was comfortable and accessible. If you're making a double XL enclosure though, you might want to make the floor even lower so that you can lean into the enclosure to access parts that are deeper in the CNC. The next step was to put in a few final bits of bracing and prepare for paint. The inside was going to be white because optimizing for lighting was something I'd intended to do from the start. The outside I had mixed feelings about, but I settled for a medium gray. It's super neutral, so it'll be a good backdrop for stickers, plus it sort of has a Tormach MX look, which I think is pretty handsome, and it'll pair well with splashes of carbide 3D green. Some people said I should stain my enclosure and preserve the wood look, but in my mind there are no redeeming features of cheap lumber worth highlighting. I belt sanded most of the surfaces to 120 grit, primed the enclosure, and chased everything with a 220 grit random orbit sanding. To do this right, I would need multiple coats to really hide all the evidence of the wood grain, but as long as I ended up with a uniform color, I would be satisfied. There are too many gaps in this enclosure for it to actually transcend its frugal origins. Painting this enclosure was really just putting lipstick on a pig. Once the tedium of painting was over, I could get to work on the hinged bits. First order of business was to install my overhead clearance door. I used a piano hinge here from Home Depot because it's really not supporting a lot of weight. Then it was time for the polycarbonate doors, and upon test fitting them, I discovered that the panels weren't perfectly square. If you rotated them, the corners wouldn't always line up, so I did the best I could to square them up. Home builders will know all too well that the reason you use trim is because you can't be perfect about the construction of everything. Using materials to hide the crimes and shortcomings of other components is really the name of the game. I assumed that plastic, being a man-made material, would be perfect right off the shelf, but it wasn't, and that assumption cost me a good chunk of time. If I had opted to place that plastic panel within a wooden frame, it probably wouldn't have been as big a deal. Per McMaster's recommendations, I would be using number 6 screws to attach my polycarbonate panels to piano hinges that I also got at McMaster. I spec'd out heavier duty hinges here because I wanted them to last. Cheap hinges will bend and deform just from installation, and with abuse and overextension, over time those ends will get dog-eared or loose, so I decided to spend a little more for the doors that I would be using the most frequently. I drilled my holes in the polycarbon as a loose fit for 632 hardware and used flange nuts to secure the panels from behind. I installed the doors as best I could. I taped some cardstock under the doors to ensure they would open and close freely, but when I was drilling my holes for the hinges, I was seriously regretting not investing in a self-centering drill bit. If you need to drill mounting holes for countersunk hardware, get the right tools for the job. Eyeballing center just doesn't work, not to mention you risk the drill bit wandering. After this, I played around with adding a little more bracing behind and on top of the enclosure to change the resonant frequency of those panels. After a lot of fine tuning and indecisive planning, I moved my Shapeoko into the enclosure, and that's when I discovered I had goofed big time. My assumption that a 28 inch deep enclosure would provide plenty of Y axis clearance in front of the machine failed to take into account that the bracing I put in would cut into the usable area. I should have stuck a Shapeoko model into my fusion assembly to verify my clearances, but I didn't, and I was feeling pretty dumb right about now. In thinking over my options, I could have attached some 2x4s to the front of my enclosure and extended the front out a couple inches, but in all honesty, I was pretty tired of this project by this point and I just wanted to get to machining something. If in the future I have a project that extends off the front of the machine, I'll make the necessary changes to the enclosure, but for now I'll stick to cutting in the area directly above the wasteboard. Alright, enough with the build, let's just go over some features. This hinged vacuum arm I jury rigged works pretty good, but it could benefit from an even more flexible vacuum hose. I'm using this Bosch hose off Amazon. Although it's far superior to any of the rigid hoses at Home Depot, it could still stand to be made from a softer material. A different vendor or even a smaller diameter hose might work better here. I had an idea to mount a monitor inside the enclosure, but it turned out to make things too crowded. The vacuum hose and the Shapeoko carriages got in the way. In the end, I installed it on the side. Coupled with a wireless mouse and keyboard, Controlling the machine is a lot easier, especially when I'm setting zero. 
I installed a light fixture with four foot LED tubes inside the enclosure biased towards the front because that's where most of the action is going to be. I installed some Harbor Freight organizer bins on the side. I like to use these to store small parts for projects that are in progress. I also have a hook to keep an air nozzle nearby, and I got some safety rails as handles to help me maneuver my enclosure around. I ended up adding some brackets in the back to strengthen these joints here because when I deploy the casters there's enough flex in the frame that sometimes my doors would pop open. These were cut from 3 quarter inch plywood using a quarter inch compression bit. I finally got over my reluctance to do deep cuts on the Shaboko. This is with quarter inch step downs in a feed rate of 30 inches per minute. And that's about all I have to say about this enclosure. I wish I could tie up this video with a single profound takeaway, but honestly this project dragged on so long I started to doubt my ability to build things. I really thought this would be the Shapoko enclosure to end all Shapoko enclosures, but in the end I learned just how many gaps there were in my planning process. Assumptions about raw materials like squareness should basically never have been made. Ergonomics and usability was something I couldn't fully assess in a CAD model. Not only did I get my height wrong initially, but I also wish I had made my enclosure just a little bit wider to make it easier to get to the sides of my machine. Trying to tighten bolts or plug-in connectors or vacuuming around my machine just feels a little too cramped. So. I guess there is actually a takeaway after all. Don't do what I did. Learn from my mistakes and regrets and build something better. I've linked my Fusion model in the description below where I already added a couple inches to the y-axis depth. It's a really messy model so I wouldn't recommend modifying it, but you can use it as a reference when you're trying to figure out what you want to make. Beyond the benefits of containing dust and noise, an enclosure should be something that benefits your workflow, not hinders it. It should be a station that puts the tools you need within reach. This is something you probably won't nail on the first try, or in my case the second try, but if you design your enclosure right, it's something you should be able to improve over time. If you've made it to the end, thank you very much for putting up with my rambling, and I'll be back soon with projects from The Machine Shop of Horrors 3.0.